There's all sorts of benign or um, non-disease-based explanations for noise in our body. And sometimes it's as simple as um, changes in the way we've been sleeping or eating. Sometimes it's larger sources of stress. Sometimes it's, um, well, it can be any number of things, and it's starting to look for those things. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 199, coming up on Big 200 here. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people just like you. And today I have an interview that's very relevant as uh, it's currently being released if you're listening to it live. This is an interview with somebody all about health anxiety. So I had the chance to talk with uh, Dr. Gordon J.G. Asmundson. He's a registered doctoral psychologist in Canada and uh, an author. He wrote the book, It's Not All in Your Head, How Worrying About Your Health Could Be Making You Sick and What You Can Do About It. Um, health anxiety has been a major topic that's been requested for years now. People have wanted me to talk about it. People have wanted me to answer questions about it, find guests to talk about it. And that was my hope here. So I brought on Dr. Asmundson to share some of his expertise about the topic. Um, obviously, right now, if you're listening to it you know, in March 2020, uh, it is coronavirus mass hysteria. So I thought it would be particularly relevant for for this week. We don't go into the coronavirus um, in particular in this uh, episode. Uh, this was right recorded right at the beginning of of all of that. So um, you know we didn't dive into that, but we do talk about health anxiety in general, some tips and techniques you can use for coping with it, ways you can sort of um, get started on that process. Lots of good stuff in the interview. So definitely stay tuned for that. And before we get into the interview proper, I wanted to give you one last reminder about the Kick Anxiety's Ass course. So if you're listening to this live on Thursday, what would it be, March 12th, you have through the weekend to jump on the offer to get the Kick Anxiety's Ass course for $75 instead of $300. Um, on Monday at midnight, I will be closing new enrollments in the course. That means nobody new can sign up for it for a period of time. And I don't know how long that's going to be. I'm going to sort of sit on it for a while, um, gather some you know, feedback and ideas. I'm going to see about developing some new content, new ways to make the course even better. And then I'm going to develop that stuff and re-release it. And that's going to be probably a little while until that happens. So you're not going to be able to access the course for a while if you don't get it before then. Um, anybody who has already purchased the course, whether it was you know a year ago or just right now during this period of time, you're going to have lifetime access to it. And so you can continue using it even while new enrollments are closed. And then any future changes that I make will be automatically updated in the version of the course that you already have. So you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really good course. I'm obviously biased, but I put my heart and soul into it. And I think it has so much information and techniques that's helpful like stuff that's just built straight out of the therapy that I do with people built off of cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, psychodynamic therapy, all these things that I borrow from in my personal approach. Uh, it, it's really helpful. And the results that I've been seeing from people are really great. You know, in, in the videos we have what, 40 lessons, um, 
is it 40 lessons? 30 lessons. 30 lessons in the course, and it's me on video talking directly to you about ways that you can adjust your life, coping skills that you can use, and information that you need to start taking your life back from anxiety. We even do kind of top-down perspective for some of them, showing you exactly how to journal, exactly how to set up an exposure hierarchy. We go through case studies, so you can see exactly how to apply everything in the course to your situation. Um, so really good stuff. Uh, again, like I said, $75 right now. Usually it's $300, but I'm doing $75 until these enrollments close to see if this more accessible price point can you know, generate you know, more people who are able to invest in themselves in this way. I think it's totally worth it. And if 75 is too much still, I do understand, you can get uh, $25 payments a month uh, as an alternative. So those are both just at kickanxietycourse.com. You don't need a coupon code or anything like that. It's already applied. And this is the last you're going to be hearing about it for a little while from me because it's going to be closing. So jump on that if you haven't yet, kickanxietycourse.com. And of course, please reach out to me if you have any questions about that. So with that promo out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the interview with Dr. Gordon J.G. Asmundson. Okay, everybody, I have a guest for you today. I have uh, Dr. Gordon Asmundson, uh, who is a registered doctoral psychologist over there in Regina in Canada. Uh, Gordon, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Can you tell everybody a little bit about sort of where you're at right now with uh, you, what, your, what your role is at, at the school, uh, what you're doing with yourself professionally, that sort of thing? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, things are pretty busy up here with a number of different uh, roles. I have a small uh, private practice about five hours a week where I see individuals primarily with anxiety related uh, conditions. Post traumatic stress right now is the most uh, common with respect to my private practice, although I also do see people with, with health anxiety and other anxiety related conditions. Most of the time, I'm you know, training uh, the next generation of clinicians, mostly, you know, here in the lab, uh, doing research as part of their graduate training and doing my own research, which is also on many different aspects of the anxiety related disorders. And then a couple of other hats I wear as um, editor in chief of the Journal of Anxiety Disorders and um, a similar role, although it's called development editor of Clinical Psychology Review. You are busy. <laughs> I can see why you only have five people in your in your private practice, or or five hours rather in your private practice. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's good to keep uh, you know the clinical skills dusted off. And hundred uh, percent. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I have like a, a small handful of like therapy clients at any given time, and I definitely don't want to do that full time because that's grueling. But uh, it is important to keep the uh, therapeutic chops, so to speak, going. It is. What, what sort of research do you do? So you said you supervise research. Obviously, you're, you're reviewing a lot of research, and then you have your own um, research that you're doing. Uh, what sort of topic areas are, are you particularly interested in for that? Yeah, so again, there's a whole bunch of different things going okay. on. Right now, a lot of it relates to um, different aspects of understanding and treating post-traumatic stress disorder in mm -hmm. The general population as well as in uh, military veterans and first responders a particular passion right now and one for which we have a number of trials going on is the application of different exercise prescriptions or different types of exercise either as standalone or as augmented um, or add-ons to CBT for uh, mental health Mm, okay. Is that, um, is that an area we know a ton about already? Or is this sort of, um, we know that exercise is good, but not necessarily what type is the best for what type of issue? Yeah, I think it's an area that's been dusted off a little bit over the last uh, five or so years. I think there was a movement in the early 70s and, and 80s, you know, we understood that uh, being active was was good for us, probably both physically and mentally, but not a lot of specific details with respect to uh, which types of exercise work best for what type of mental health issues. And and we're learning more and more about that and and how to how to tailor specific types of exercise for a person's preferences, but also uh, the types of condition that they might be experiencing. 
That's really interesting to me. You know, I, I obviously am routinely telling people that, yes, as you know, exercise is helpful, <laughs> helpful for your body, helpful for your mind, stuff like that. But it would be uh, really great to be able to, as you said, almost like more prescriptively to be able to say, uh, you know, for this issue, it looks like this type of exercise would be particularly helpful if you could make that happen. Are, are we there yet? Like, are there some areas that you would be able to sort of like advise somebody on in that way? I think that we are getting there. You know, for example, we know that resistance training appears to work better for post-traumatic stress huh. symptoms. Also, uh, we know that uh, certain types of um, aerobic training, like moderate intensity continuous training, um, works well for, um, I guess, being able to or learning how to tolerate distress um, generally. So there, there are some so specific applications for yeah. certain exercise types, and then there are some more general uh, applications that, that are not specific to a given condition. But, that's, you know, so we're getting there. That's fascinating. And are, I mean, are we looking at like the, uh, the reason behind that? Like, so why resistance training would be particularly helpful for someone with PTSD symptoms? I think, I think identifying the me mechanisms is um, something that we're still working on. You know, why is it working that way? There's some um, hypotheses, you know, that uh, aerobic training would work as a form of exposure to oh, feared, sure. bo feared bodily sensations. Now, so some of the studies are suggesting that may be the case, and some are suggesting that may not be the case. So it's not as simple there are some hypotheses, but um, you know the, the the findings are not necessarily uh, bearing those out. You know, without um, mixed findings. Right. Well, so we're working on it. Yeah. yeah, super interesting though. I think that's like a, I'm excited to see that develop in the research. I'm curious, for, like for yourself, backing up a little bit. Like, have you always um, were you always interested in in psychology? How did you get into this field? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, my son was just doing um, an Ask the Expert assignment for, oh. <laughs> for, for school today. So I did this interview with him last night. That that's exactly. hilarious. Okay, so you, yeah. so you are well rehearsed then. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, I initially had plans of becoming, um, amongst other things, like an NHL uh, goaltender. Okay. Um, I, I was going to be... Uh, Super Canadian. Yeah, super Canadian uh, physician. You know, I wanted to be a physician, and I took an introductory psychology course as part of you know the pre med requirements. And uh, I had an awesome professor and was absolutely fascinated. So I took another one, and then the, you know the second year I took uh, probably another one. The second term of the second year, and by that time I was hooked. Um, so, you know, it start, started at that point and it just continued to progress. And then my specific interests within psychology became refined over, you know, the course of my undergraduate and early graduate training. So um, that wasn't the initial plan, but mm -hmm. uh, quickly became uh, the reality. Hey, friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, this episode is brought to you by our return sponsor, BetterHelp. A lot of you guys have reached out to me via email or direct message and let me know that a part of your journey has been using BetterHelp to get some online therapy. Let's talk about what BetterHelp is. BetterHelp assesses your needs and matches you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating with them in under 24 hours. It's not a crisis line or self-help or peer support. It's professional counseling done securely online. They have a broad range of expertise in their BetterHelp counselor network. So if you have a particular need that's not met in your local area by the providers there, there's a good chance that you'll be able to find somebody within BetterHelp that can help you with those issues. And the service is available to clients worldwide. Basically, you just log into your account anytime. You can send a message to your counselor and you'll get a timely and thoughtful response back. Plus, you can also schedule weekly video sessions or phone sessions and basically do the same thing as in-person therapy, but without all the discomfort that can sometimes come along with that. This is great for people that have crazy schedules. This is great for people that are geographically isolated, um, have a physical limitation that doesn't let them get to 
regular therapy sessions often, these are all great candidates for a service like this. Um, BetterHelp is also committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so it's very easy and free to change counselors if you need to. And typically, it tends to be more affordable than traditional offline counseling. They have financial aid available as well if you need that. So BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website, look at some of the testimonials that are posted there daily at betterhelp.com slash reviews. And if you feel like this would be something useful for you, visit betterhelp.com slash duff. And that's H-E-L-P, better H-E-L-P. And join the over 700,000 other people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. A special offer for the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast listeners is that you get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp by going to betterhelp.com slash duff. All right, back to the show. Were your interests refined by simply sort of getting exposure to different classes or, um, you know, uh, internship experiences or whatever, or did it have an overlap with like your life at all? Um, yeah, I think that it had a little bit of an overlap with, with some of my life experiences and it also was refined by, um, different courses and, and different things I learned. I, in certain contexts was very shy as a child and in other contexts I wasn't and that fascinated me. So I was interested in that um, um, shyness or social anxiety, particularly with respect to speaking uh, in front of groups and uh, was also learning about uh, at the time agoraphobia, you know, uh, panic attacks and panic disorder were sort of around the corner, but a lot of talk about agoraphobia in some of the classes and textbooks I was reading. And mm -hmm. together, those things really uh, uh, piqued my curiosity and um, became very interested in anxiety at, uh, at that stage and understanding how it worked and, you know, how people dealt with it. And your your background in the way that you sort of look at things is primarily cognitive behavioral, right? Yeah, that's right. What, so what does that mean to you? Like um, when you say that, you know, you're you're mainly focused on cognitive behavioral therapy for, for anxiety. How, how do you see all of that sort of uh, playing out? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I see us as very complex creatures, uh, obviously, um, bound in some ways by our physiology and also uh, influenced largely by the way we think about and interact with certain situations. So, you know, our, the way we think influences the way we respond uh, and, and the behaviors that follow, which then in mm -hmm. turn also uh, influence our thoughts with respect to situations and ourselves. And those in turn continue to influence. And on and on. We behave. Yeah. Yeah. I get a lot of questions about. So I, I have a ton of them actually, like in my, I have like a little email folder, you know, that where if someone asks a question for the podcast, I toss it in there, you know, and I get tons and tons and tons of questions that are just simply like, can you address health anxiety on your show? Can you talk about health anxiety? Things like that. Um, and while I kind of understand that health anxiety is anxiety related to health, uh, sometimes I'm not exactly sure what people are, what people are asking for. Um, in your experience, you know, obviously I've seen some of your research you've done related to health, you know, and, and anxiety, those intersections. Um, what do you think like health anxiety usually means when people are talking about it? Yeah. So if people are asking you that question, I think what they might be asking is if there's a way to learn more about the worry or concern or the trepidation that they're feeling with respect to something being physically wrong mm -hmm. with them. So, you know, there's something going on. I've got, for example, a pain in my head. Could that be a brain tumor or something else that is um, physically responsible for that and that's likely to lead to my uh, demise? Sometimes it's about catching um, a disease, but a lot of times it's worry or concern that one has a disease. Right, right. So, you know, in, in your, like, your practice and in, in, in your approach, um, 
what do you do with that? You know, because I, I, I think that there are a lot of overlaps, right? There's a lot of overlaps between like physiological symptoms of anxiety and things that are legitimately happen physiologically. Sometimes that line isn't so clear, you know? So like, where do you start in trying to like address that a little bit? Yeah. So it can be, this can be a very challenging thing to address because sure. people often have a conviction that what I typically refer to as bodily noise, we all have noisy bodies mm. and a lot of conviction that that bodily noise in their body is because of a disease. Now there's some reason to um, run through self diagnostics when you do have uh, noise in your body, because it could be a signal that something is wrong, but if it persists and it starts impacting your you know your functional ability then you know it's probably not adaptive anymore and it's something else so but i guess the goal to but to back up to the mm -hmm. the question is the, the the goal is to help a person discover non-disease based explanations for bodily sensations or changes that they're experiencing so that bodily noise provided that it doesn't have a medical basis Right, right. And so so I guess part of the job is trying to help somebody make that distinction better. Like like you know, how do you how do you tell the difference between just bodily noise and a signal of something? When do you know when it's appropriate to check, you know, how much checking is too much? I, I definitely have gotten questions where people ask, you know, do I just have O C D or health anxiety? I think that I feel I see all these blemishes, I feel all this bodily noise, as you said, and I, I feel like I need to check everything. Um, so where do we figure out where a healthy degree of caution or interest is versus being, you know, anxious or compulsive about it? Right. And that's part of the, that's part of the process is finding that balance mm -hmm. so, that, uh, so that people can function and make I guess, wise decisions about that bodily noise. So it's finding that balance and that's the trick. So that sounds like a simple question, but it's, it, that's actually um, the basis of treatment for health anxiety. Yeah. I, I, I understand it's kind of the crux of it. Right. But what, um, like, where can someone start, you know, and maybe they're on their own or working with a therapist, you know, in, in trying to better understand that balance for themselves. How do they start to figure that out? You know, I guess it starts, um, I mean, for different people, it starts in different places. It, it depends on the person's experience. And a lot of times a person will be seeing uh, their their family physician mm -hmm. and they'll probably have seen them repeatedly, or they'll be uh, also conferring with their social group. Um, reassurance seeking is quite common. Uh, and, and oftentimes they're told that, well, you know what? There's nothing physically wrong. You just don't don't worry about it. Um, mm -hmm. Or, or you know, unfortunately, sometimes you know, uh, it's all in your head. You don't need to be worrying about this. And that that's not setting up uh, a person uh, for successful coping because what they're experiencing is real. You know, it may not be disease based, but those bodily sensations and changes or that bodily noise that they're experiencing is real. So it's not all in their head. It's something they experience. And it, so it has to start with, um, you know, letting a person know that, yes, what you're experiencing is, um, is real. And we need to work together to find a way to understand why this is happening. Mm. it's sort of it's like uh there's a difference between coping with the pain and figuring out the pain right it's like the, the if, if a pain or whatever symptom it is like you have the symptom there and it is what it is it's real now our interpretation and what we sort of do about that is is something we have like a little bit more um perhaps influence over even though it's not easy yeah correct so we need to yeah, find an explanation for it that so and and this assumes um, you know a comprehensive um, evaluation to rule out in many cases to rule out medical um, 
medical causes for that. Mm-hmm. And, and so um, there are a lot of beliefs that can, or misbeliefs that can feed um, the way one interprets medical findings as well. So sometimes that has to come into uh, to be a consideration. But what do you mean by that? How people interpret the medical findings? Well, you know, a lot of times people will uh, hear from one doctor that, you know, there's, you know, we've done all the tests, there's nothing really wrong. And they'll go for a second opinion and a third opinion. And sometimes this is related to um, beliefs that, for example, uh, medical systems or medical tests can't be trusted. Mm. It's things that derail um, the ability to look for or find non-disease based explanations for those experiences because maybe we've been raised to always attribute a pain or um, a a lump under the skin or a a rash or you pick it um, to uh, physical or disease-based cause. Right. I'm kind of imagining that a a, a a lot of the first parts of this have to do with like um, broadly education, like educating the, them them or them educating themselves a little bit about um, you know what what is within the realm of normal. Obviously, getting a workup done to to rule out certain things. Um, however, at the same time, I imagine that process of educating themselves, getting getting more information, can be sort of triggering to people's anxiety if they already have this this anxiety about their health. Right. Right. Yeah. And so people will always begin or typically begin with a visit to the doctor. You know, if if there is this um, body sensation or change that um, doesn't resolve within a week, you know, Mm -hmm. you can, again, pick any system like a a pain in one's head. So, um, you know, we all we all get headaches, but what if it persists uh, over the course of a day or two or three, you know, and, and stays relatively continuous. So you go to the doctor and then usually some tests come along and um, quite oftentimes it's, you know, there's, there's nothing physically wrong. And those atypical headaches continue or, you know, uh, they come and go um, and it just, raises concern and maybe there's a history and it usually um, one specific focus of anxiety, health anxiety might relate to something that has happened in the past. So a relative that died from a brain tumor or an aneurysm right. or something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so there's, there's concern um, in terms of that self diagnostic process. I need to know if something's wrong with me um, with respect to um, my brain health in this case and it will persist quite often until one gets an answer that they're willing to accept. And as I was mentioning earlier, quite oftentimes um, there's a predisposition to uh, have a conviction that any bodily sensation or change must be due to uh, a disease and not something else until somebody's guided to, to, to think about what those other options might be, because there are many things that can lead to bodily sensations or changes. There are many things that can lead to that head pain other than something being physically wrong. Mm. Does, uh, does exposure tend to pay, play any role in this type of work for you? exposure in terms of exposure therapy uh yeah like uh, exposure to the uh like letting them feel that noise or explore that that noise in the body and and yeah. try try to not be as freaked out by it yeah it can um at you know at the appropriate point right and, and depending on the type of uh bodily noise that uh or sensations and changes that one is having so you know there might be some exposure to show people that um, for example um, elevating your heart rate by running on the spot or hyperventilating is discomforting but it's not dangerous Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so yeah so that that 
typical uh, interoceptive exposure. And then there are some other types of exposure, depending on whether it's uh, fear of having a disease versus fear of catching disease. How do you work with that when it's like, um, so someone gets checked out, you know, and, and they're given basically the all clear from, from their doctor. Uh, maybe there is or isn't a family history that they're, that they're a, a little bit concerned about, but they just find themselves ruminating. Well, what if something's wrong now? What if something's wrong? What if it's this? What if it's that? Um, and it's just really the ruminative, ruminating thought process. Right. So, I mean, unfortunately, those folks are not the ones likely to walk into a psychologist's office <laughs> because they are ruminating typically over um, disease-based explanations, right? So they may be uh, eventually going back to the, the doctor. They may be checking with their, um, with their loved ones, you know, you think everything's all right. Am I going to be okay? So this, there's this uh, reassurance seeking. And um, because the focus isn't on, um, I guess, alternatives to, uh, disease-based explanations, they typically f- only further down the line uh, come in to see a psychologist. Sometimes yeah. it's on the doctor's part, right? Sometimes they're like, hey, you're fine. You probably have anxiety. And then they have to kind of try to confront that reality. Yes. Yeah. And and sometimes they're fortunate enough to have uh, a physician will, who will say, you know, this is probably related to stress and anxiety. I'd like you to go explore that a little bit further. And Mm -hmm. uh, here's some people you could talk about that with, as opposed to just saying, you know what, this is nothing to worry about. It's just all right. Right. Which is not helpful. Well, I do hear a lot about that too. And also when somebody, uh, you know, sort of has anxiety tacked onto their chart, that things start to, that starts to become the easy answer for everything that it's just anxiety, right? Like a stomach problem, a cardiovascular problem, whatever. It's, it's just anxiety. Right. Yeah. And that's an unfortunate way of putting it. You know, mm-hmm. it's just anxiety because, because that, uh, the physical manifestation of that is, uh, just as real. It's, it's yeah, can you talk about that a bit? Cause like I, I, you know, somatization conversion, there's all these, you know, terms that are thrown around a lot of times by doctors and that you get that feeling that it's that, Oh, well I shouldn't feel this way because it's just anxiety or whatever, which is kind of a slap in the face. Right. Yeah. So, um, I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, how do you see it, you know, in terms of what's real versus okay. what's not real, how somebody should, you know, um, feel about that when, when anxiety is an issue, but it, you know, they're still feeling things. R- right. Yeah. And I mean, the, um, the bottom line is what you're feeling is real, you know? So if you're feeling, um, pain in your chest or you're feeling, uh, nauseous or you're feeling you know, cramps in your muscles there's there's a whole variety of things those are real and the question becomes and I you know I say to people you know you've tried a lot of other avenues to get explanations you don't you owe it to yourself to look at some alternatives as well so what it is is real but let's find out what's at the root of it, right? Mm. So is it um, something physical, like a disease process? It doesn't look like it. So could it be, um, you know, could it be stress? And that's not the only thing. Could it be um, changes in the way you've been living life over the past couple of weeks? Could it be something else? And then exploring those options systematically to find out um, whether one of those alternative explanations works. Right. Is it a little bit of a trial and error? Like, for instance, uh, are you looking at having somebody try to learn coping skills in general, reduce stress in general, things like that, and seeing whether it has an effect or not on those symptoms that they're experiencing? Yeah, I think there's some general... um, strategies and then there's some specific strategies so uh, you know 
in some of the early studies uh, looking at cognitive behavior therapy for health anxiety, uh, progressive muscle relaxation was used as a control condition. And it was found to be almost as effective as CBT. So learning to effectively manage um, stress and being able to turn off your sympathetic nervous system and you know go to business as usual parasympathetic nervous system where we're relaxed actually has benefits to people with health anxiety but that's a general strategy right we all benefit from learning how to um how to relax mm -hmm. so but what it does too is it shuts down a lot of that uh, a lot of that noise in the body right so there's less to misinterpret for example, or it could be um, reducing tension in one's neck and shoulder area, which is leading to fewer headaches. So relaxation um, taught in a specific way can be very effective as a general strategy. And there, there are also some very specific things uh, to help anxiety that can be effective as well. Any examples of those, the specifics? Um, yeah, I guess... Um, Teaching, and then this is also through you know behavioral experiments or trial and error, okay. is um, getting people to look at some of the ways that they're coping and how those might actually be feeding the fuel of health anxiety. So okay, interesting. Uh, yeah, reassurance seeking is one that I've mentioned already. Uh, excessive health related uh, checking behaviors so uh, you know people with health anxiety spend a lot of time on the internet right. checking for health information and going to blogs where other individuals with with health anxiety are commenting and those are very unhelpful uh, in fact there's a uh, a term has been coined for for that condition um cyberchondria is, uh, <laughs> yeah is what people are calling this right and so that's just one form of um excessive types of checking behavior um okay. one you can also check um certain parts of your body to the point where you're actually creating um pain discomfort and swelling you know so if i thought i had a lump in my um uh, in my throat or on, on my forearm and i or in my breast and I palpate it and I continue to do that and I continue to do it over the next 10 minutes, it's actually going to be red, swollen and sore, whether yeah. there was really something there or not. Sure. So it's, work, it's working through behavioral experiments like that. Um, it's, it's having people try to change their coping strategies. Let's do less checking and let's do, um, more of something else and see what happens mm -hmm. and, you know, so that they can learn and so they can recalibrate. It's, it's, it's not, there's not something wrong. It's that the calibration is off. Sure. So, it's almost practicing a different way of, of being right. Like you're practicing, um, in the absence of this coping, you know, in air quotes, coping strategy that like we realize might be actually problematic. So in the absence of that, let's practice how to exist without that sort of crutch there. Exactly. Yeah. So that in, in my mind, that is a, like a type of exposure, right? Like exposing yourself to the, the internal feelings that are probably negative of not having the ability to, to check and, and get that quick fulfillment of looking into it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you know what's funny is so you're you're that what you just talked about with the blemishes it's not funny but um i it just reminded me of a, a case that i just saw of um what we would call delusional par parasitosis right so the, the belief that you have animals of some kind small bugs or whatever under your skin and that's what where i see that exact thing playing out all the time where uh they show you arms legs look look at all these little diggings or 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 holes that they made and that's from them picking not from the bugs themselves and so you can really feed into the own your own um just interpretation of the situation through the actions that you take yes yeah that's exactly the case here as well yeah gotcha um okay now a, a slight left turn is so pain and mental health have, have like a huge connection right like a, in any good pain management program especially for people that live with some type of chronic pain there's a there's a big psychological component of that right yes. um 
And I, I got the question recently, I was doing a talk about like living, you know, kind of a fulfilling life with chronic illness. And someone asked me, so do these strategies actually reduce pain? Like, do they help you feel less pain or does it take the pain away? Um, what's your thought about that? <laughs> So strategies such as Str strategies such as like, uh, you know, stress reduction through breathing or mindfulness, maybe things that that are supposed to help you cope better with the pain in addition to your physical efforts. Right. Yeah. So, you know, um, that's a really good question. And I think that depending on the approach one takes to chronic pain management, um, well, regardless of the approach one takes, quite oftentimes the, the outcome is similar. And those strategies can also reduce pain severity. And, and there's data that shows this, that, okay. um, that you know, if one uses a, 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 an acceptance and commitment therapy approach to pain management, or one uses a uh, more CBT focused approach to uh, pain management. So that that's helping one in, in both cases helps one function despite the pain as opposed right. to the goal being reduction of pain. There is a reduction in uh, the pain that follows in many cases, at least uh, in some of the randomized controlled trials. Okay. That was kind of my question is like, is it, is it just about getting on better terms with your pain or does getting on better terms with your pain kind of have the happy accident of actually making you feel less of it? Yeah. And I think it's actually that, that okay. latter being the case that there is that happy accident that pain reduces, um, even with, um, you know, graded in vivo exposure, uh, approaches to pain management. So this is for people who have chronic musculoskeletal pain with a high fear uh, component to that pain, which is quite common. Um, the goal there is to reduce the, the fear response towards behaviors that are associated with pain. You know, so I might not bend over to pick up my groceries or to pick up my child or play with my child because I have a fear that I'm going to re-injure my back and have, have pain associated with that. If we reduce that fear of pain that the happy accident in those cases too as shown by a number of randomized control trials is the pain severity also decreases shortly thereafter mm -hmm. this sounds like something that that really um if you're having um a, a strong version of this health anxiety or you know the the pain related anxiety any of these things we're talking about it sounds like more than a lot of other psychological issues this is one that that really benefits from working with a team like working with uh mental health professional, doctor, et cetera. Yes. Having like a close collaboration, communication uh, at minimum between the, you know, the physician and the, the mental health professional can really facilitate uh, that process for both people with health anxiety and people with uh, chronic, different types of chronic pain conditions. Yeah. It kind of, probably hard to do on your own in a lot of cases, because that's where you fall into some of these traps, you know, some of these um, uh, coping strategies that aren't exactly doing the trick, right? Yeah. And you might also be getting different information from True. You know, the right hand and the left hand. And right. If, if, if they're on the same page, then um, it can function quite well and to, to the person's benefit. And, you know, both health anxiety and um, people with different types of chronic pain tend to overuse uh, the various medical services. And so working together, uh, the, the person who has that condition, the psychologist and the medical professionals, um, they can actually come to an agreement on when it's appropriate to mm. use medical services versus when it might be appropriate to do other things. Right, right. And, and both are an option, but it's it's coming to that determination. Yes. Okay. Well, so obviously we've been talking for a little bit here. So I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I, I'm curious as to, um, you know, let's say we have somebody listening, as we inevitably will, who uh, strongly suspects that like they're they're having an issue with with health anxiety, health related anxiety. Um, 
but they're not in the process yet. They're not, they're not uh, addressing it. They're just having a really hard time with it. Um, do you have any advice for them just in terms of where their next steps are, how to get started, what they can maybe do on their own in the meantime to just try to keep things together as much as they can to, to live uh, their life while they're figuring this out? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are some, um, you know, there's information available through a variety of books and probably a variety of online sources and, and shows like yours where um, people can get information about what to do when they're deciding, um, you know, what to do. The most important thing, I think, is for people to realize that if they are having um, some sort of bodily sensation or change or some sort of noise in their body that that is new that they can't explain that they worry might be a sign of some sort of um, disease process or other physical condition to first of all go to the doctor and begin the process of, of um, finding evidence about whether there is a disease-based explanation for what's going on if there's not, or the doctor doesn't identify something, you know, it, sometimes it's a good idea to go get a second opinion. After that, if the evidence is consistent, then it's looking for other possible explanations. There's all sorts of benign or um, non-disease-based explanations for noise in our body. And sometimes it's as simple as... Um, changes in the way we've been sleeping or eating. Sometimes it's larger sources of stress. Sometimes it's, um, well, it can be any number of things, and it's starting to look for those things. And uh, reaching out to um, maybe a mental health professional to, to see what uh, they might suggest. Great. Yeah, very helpful. Um, Thank you for your time. Is there is there anything that you would want to point people toward in terms of what what you're working on, ways to connect, anything else that you want to let people know about before before I let you go here? Um, you know, there's I guess in terms of help, um, there's a couple of uh, books that are written for people with health anxiety, and uh, I'm, I don't want to plug um, my own work, but we do have. A Please book. do plug plug anything. It's that's so, what you're well, here for. There's there's a book that uh, that I've received um, feedback from a number of individuals uh, over the years being very helpful uh, that Steve Taylor and I wrote um, called it's it's not all in your head uh, how oh. worrying about your health could be making you sick and what you can do about it so it's actually some very practical steps um, in a more systematic fashion than we talked uh, today but um, much of the same information so people can. Um, uh, get that and um, it can guide them with respect to what to do. There are other books, uh, Marty Anthony uh, and some colleagues have another book that's meant um, for people with health anxiety as, as opposed uh, to the therapist. So there's a whole host of books for uh, therapists, but there are those that are um, meant to provide information for people who are experiencing and trying to cope with health anxiety. Cool. So we'll make sure that we get the uh, the links for those, like in the show notes, so people can check those out. Um, if 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 people wanted to connect with you, are you present on any um, any social media, or you just email anything like that? Um, yeah, if people want to connect with me, uh, email is the best. Um, I'm trying to um, figure out how to uh, Twitter and tweet. And, uh, <laughs> Um, you know, I'm visible on, uh, Facebook and other places as well. So, okay. but email is the best way to connect with me. All right. And sometimes I'm, I'm hesitant about opening up that can of worms as a professor. You probably have a lot of email. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, I do get, uh, I do get people with health anxiety, uh, in particular reaching out to me. Mm -hmm. Um, it's okay. Sometimes it's tough for me to respond, but I always do eventually. Sure. Sure. Okay. Fair. Well, um, thank you so much for your time and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Good luck with the continuing research. And uh, if you have any exciting updates from that exercise line, uh, reach out so we can, we can disseminate that information. I will do that. Thanks so much for having me on your show and you take care. You too.